Father, today on Easter Sunday, it is our joy, it is our privilege to proclaim the truth of your resurrection. Father, to praise you comes so naturally today. And as we sing these words, we realize that often our hope is wavering. But our prayer, our desire, is that our hope would be unwavering hope because of Jesus Christ, because of his death, because of his life, and because of his resurrection. God, use your word, use this morning in our lives to transform the world. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that Jesus Christ was born in a little town called Bethlehem. I believe that he lived a sinless life. I believe that he was crucified and killed by Roman soldiers. I believe that he was placed in a grave, in a tomb, and that the tomb was covered with a huge stone. I believe that Jesus, in his death, died in my place and took the penalty for sin that I deserve. But I believe that he was buried on Friday, but on Sunday morning, he was no longer dead. I agree with John Updike, who wrote this. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was his body. If the cell's disillusion did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. I believe John Updike was simply agreeing with Paul who wrote this to the Corinthians, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because I believe that the resurrection best explains the events of 2,000 years ago. There have been hundreds and hundreds of attempts to explain what happened at the early part of the 100s when Jesus Christ was on earth. And as we look at some of those explanations, they raise even more questions, at least in my way of thinking. And I want to talk about just a few inferior explanations of the events that happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, there are some who looked at this episode and said, well, it's easily explained this way. Uh, there was no empty tomb. The women on the morning of the supposed resurrection went to the wrong place. Here's the problem. They weren't expecting Jesus to rise. And if you went to the wrong tomb, wouldn't you just try to find the right one? That's what I would do. And if you found a tomb where there was a resurrection, um, great. <laughs> uh, but this explanation is so inferior. Why didn't authorities go to the right tomb, supply the dead body of Jesus, and kill Christianity right then and there? Uh, another explanation of the empty tomb would go something like this. Uh, the tomb was empty because Jesus wasn't really dead. Well, Friday night, Thor Lundberg explained to us the whole process of crucifixion. The Romans were experts at killing people this way. It's hard to believe that they would have made a mistake and, oh, this guy isn't really dead, let's bury him. It's almost impossible. And as you think about what happened, Jesus was stabbed in the heart. How can someone with no medical attention paid to them at all be stabbed in the heart, placed in a grave for three days, and get up and limp out in front of Roman soldiers who are guarding the entrance? Uh, again, an inferior explanation. 
another explanation would go something like this. Uh, the tomb was empty because the body was taken by the authorities. Again, if the authorities had taken the body, why didn't they just produce it and again kill this Christian movement? Uh, the explanations go on and on. Uh, another explanation would go uh, something like this. The tomb was empty because it, the body was taken by grave robbers. Why did people become grave robbers? Because they went in to take what was in the grave, specifically the grave clothes of the person who had died. You don't leave the most valuable part of the robbery behind you if you are a grave robber. Another explanation is the tomb was empty because the body was taken by the disciples. Well, if you read anything from the Gospels, you know that the disciples were a bunch of scared chickens at this point in time. They were running for their lives. They were hiding out. They were not conniving as to how they could steal the body of Jesus and start a false religious movement that would endanger their lives. How could they do this under the noses of Roman soldiers? And why would you die later on in life for something that you lied about earlier on? Uh, another explanation would be, well, the disciples didn't really see Jesus. It was an hallucination. I was watching a documentary a while back uh, about the Grateful Dead. And uh, this is a, a rock band, and they showed the audience at a Grateful Dead concert who were all tripping out on acid, many of them hallucinating. You don't hallucinate in unison. You don't sit around saying, hey, wow, we all see that white rabbit, right? Hallucinations don't come in unison. They are individual hallucinations. And the chances that a group of people, person after person after person, has an identical hallucination is as remarkable as a resurrection. These are all inferior explanations of the resurrection. But there is superior evidence. The tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. Nobody argues about that. You read in Matthew that there was an attempt to explain it. But the tomb was empty. The empty tomb started this whole thing called Christianity. There's no doubt that the tomb was empty. Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to come back from death. I'm going to be alive. And finally, or, or thirdly, there's this complete transformation of the disciples. They were scared chickens. They were running for their lives. They didn't know what end was up. But all of a sudden, after the resurrection, these scared chickens become bold as lions and they die simply because they won't turn their back on Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, simply because they won't say the resurrection was a lie. Chuck Colson was a part of the Watergate burglary and cover-up. And one of the things he wrote about as he came to Christ was that he saw a complete breakdown of a conspiracy. As soon as people were in danger, they quit lying because they didn't want to go to jail just for a lie. Conspiracies break down. But the disciples were completely transformed into different men and women. Another evidence is the unstoppable church. The church hasn't stopped for 2,000 years. How do you explain that this church founded on the resurrection keeps going and going and going? Powerful rulers around the world have tried to snuff it out. It keeps going and going. Look at the church in China today. The church is unstoppable. And also, the credibility of the many witnesses 
Paul and others, to me, are credible witnesses of what happened. The Bible records 11 resurrection appearances. Mary Magdalene, other women, Annas and Cleopas, Simon Peter, all the apostles except Thomas, all the apostles plus Thomas, all the apostles again, 500 people in Galilee, James, the brother of Christ, all of the apostles plus a crowd of 120, and Paul himself. On top of all this evidence, I have come to believe the truth of the resurrection in the core of my being. Like Paul, as he wrote to the Romans, my experience has been that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. When I was a little boy, we used to sing a song. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. In his great song entitled simply, The Creed, Rich Mullins put the words of the Apostles' Creed to music. And the chorus of his song had a refrain. And the refrain went like this. I did not make it. No, it is making me. That's been my experience with the resurrection. I didn't make it. I didn't make it up, but it is making me. The longer I live, the more I am sure of it. The longer I live, the more I see the power of it. And because Jesus lives in me, I know that he isn't dead. And because he isn't dead, and because he lives in me, life is so very, very different. Paul talks about this as he wrote to the Corinthians. And I invite you to turn with me to the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians this morning. And if you brought a Bible, that's great. If you didn't, please use one of ours. It's around the room and it's on page 962 if you want to use one of those Bibles. And Paul wrote an entire chapter about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what a difference that makes in, in all of life. And, and he uses some words in the verses that we're going to look at over and over again. Uh, he uses the words perishable and imperishable. And as we think about perishable and imperishable, we usually think about foods. Uh, there is perishable food. You go to the grocery store and you buy some food, you put it in the refrigerator and um, it lasts for a while, but eventually it, it goes away. It, it, you want to throw it away. You don't want to eat it. There is perishable and there is imperishable. There is mortal and immortal. And, and, and Paul uses those words a lot as he writes to the Corinthians. He'd written to them earlier in this chapter and said, man, if it wasn't for the resurrection, this is a big waste of time. It's all in vain. And he concludes this great chapter, and if you're doubting the resurrection, if you're wondering about the truth of the resurrection, I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter, but uh, this morning we want to look at just the conclusion of 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, 
Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We know that Paul believed the truth of the resurrection. He mentions it time and time again in the many letters that he wrote to churches in the first century. He devoted this entire chapter to this subject of the resurrection. But he goes beyond just stating the truth of the resurrection. Paul so often follows the logic of a truth. If this is true, then this is also true, and this is also true. And here, follow, here Paul follows the truth of Christ's resurrection and gets all the way, as he follows logically these truths, to how that impacts you and me. What difference it makes to us. In our present flesh and blood form, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's not of this world and these bones and the skin that covers these bones and even our brains. What God is doing ultimately at the end of all time isn't about this flesh and blood that we now experience. In fact, when Christ returns to earth one day, whether we are alive or whether we've already died, we shall all be changed. We'll receive a new resurrection body like Jesus. When he rose from the grave, he had this new body. It was real. It was, you could touch it. He ate. There were marks on it from what he'd experienced on the cross. But you know some of the things about that body. It could move around without the limitations that we have with our physical bodies. And we're going to have that kind of a body one day. We will receive a new resurrection body like Jesus. As Paul is writing this, you can kind of feel his excitement building throughout this entire chapter, but especially in these last verses. And he bursts out and he quotes from the Old Testament, a book of Hosea. And he says, oh death, where is your victory? And when he asks that question and when he quotes Hosea, the answer to that question is, death doesn't have a victory anymore because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, death, where is your sting? The answer to that question is, Jesus took the sting of death. There is no sting anymore. And then he says, but thanks be to God who gives us this victory through Jesus Christ. Because of this great truth, because of the resurrection, there should be an impact on what you do, how you live this doesn't mean that you just go through days in a ho-hum fashion. Eating your cinnamon toast crunch and drinking your orange juice. There's more to life because of the resurrection. Because of this truth, we should live differently. Now, many of you are saving money for your retirement. You're doing this because you've heard some things. You, you've heard that, well, Social Security will probably not give you enough to live at a certain standard of living. So you're saving money because you're looking ahead into the future and you believe that a truth that you've heard is actually going to be true and so you want to prepare for that. Why? Well, because you believe it. And so Paul is simply saying here that there's this truth about the resurrection and that truth 
is so important and that truth is so overarching it sits over all of life and it should impact every day it should impact your life and in fact he closes this section in verse 58 by telling us the logical impact of the resurrection therefore my beloved brothers be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord knowing that your labor that, or that in the lord your labor is not in vain what amazes me about our world is its flakiness. Um, the world is always changing. And there are always these weird things that pop up in our world, aren't there? I, I was interested recently to look at the food pyramid. Did you know that the food pyramid today is different than it was 10 years ago? How can the food pyramid change? Well, it, it has. 30 years ago, as a first year school teacher, I had to learn CPR. How many of you have learned CPR? Did you know that the technique for CPR is different today than it was 30 years ago? Saving a life 30 years ago was done one way and today it's, it's different. Our world is flaky and always changing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ puts me on the solid foundation that isn't going anywhere. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. What hasn't changed in the last 2,000 years? Answer, nothing but God and his word and his church. How about investing our lives? Whatever stage in life you are at right now, I imagine that you care about how you invest that life. Uh, students, you take courses. You have to pass tests. You want a, a little degree on your wall eventually. And as a student, you don't want to waste a class. And so many times I hear students talking about, ah, oh, that's a wasted class. Or you ought to take that class because it's an easy A. You don't have to spend much time in it. It's, it's kind of a waste. All you have to do is go there and get the A. How do you want to invest your life? Do you want to invest it in something that is a waste of time? Parents with children of any age, <laughs> at any stage in life. Parents, do you want a wasted life for your kid? I, I've never met a parent, even bad parent, who, who would say, yeah, I really hate my kids, so I'm raising them so they'll waste their life. <laughs> even bad parents don't want their kids to waste their lives. Workers who go to work day after day. As I've had the opportunity to talk to men over lunches at some of the finest restaurants in Broomfield. <laughs> Almost every one of them is concerned about not wasting time. Some of them say, you know, I'm, I'm just concerned about my job. I don't want to waste my life. I feel like I'm kind of wasting my time here. And even as we get to the end of our lives, we don't want to waste a moment of our lives. One of the saddest stories that I know to be true because I happen to have met the man happened uh, many, many years ago, 60 years ago. There's a man that graduated from college. He was hired by a company right out of college. And the company said, we're going to build a plant. We're going to start manufacturing some things. We're going to start making some stuff here. So we want you to be in on the ground level. And so this man, for the first several years of his work life, worked at designing 
and building and putting a plant together. And for his entire work life, then he worked in this plant. And when he was in his late 50s, almost 60, the owners of the plant came to him and said, we're done. And we have to take this plant apart. So we'd like you to spend the last five years that you're working tearing down this plant, figuring out how to dispose of everything and do it in an orderly fashion. And I felt so sorry for this man because at 65 years of age, there was no evidence that he'd been on earth. He had built a plant, worked in it his whole life and then tore it down. But then I got to thinking that that's the way a lot of us are, isn't it? What kind of a person do you want to be? What kind of a life do you want to live? I I was thinking about the opposite of these verses in 1 Corinthians. And, And here would be the opposite. Brothers, be unsteady, always moving with no foundation in your life, never knowing if what you are doing makes any difference in any way. I don't know of anyone who would sign up for that. I'd like that. (laughs) Don't ever want to know if I'm on a solid foundation or not. Don't ever care if anything I'm doing makes any difference whatsoever to anybody. I contrast that with Paul's words. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We live in a world that looks as if death has the last laugh. Some of you here have experienced death recently. And the chances are that if you haven't experienced death with those around you, you probably will soon. As you think life through from beginning to end, it might seem that death still has a sting. It might seem that death still has a victory. You think of human beings that you know. And even in the years that I've spent here at Calvary, we've seen death in a variety of ways. Death has not been limited to the very old. There have, been, there have been experiences of death in the Calvary family of the very young. It seems as if death came at the wrong time. This morning, you may be here without ever thinking about any difference that the resurrection of Jesus Christ would ever make in your life. You may be here having known about this truth of the resurrection for a long, long time, but you're kind of finding yourself lethargic. Does the resurrection grip you? Does this truth impact the hours of your day? Paul is saying to the Corinthians and to us, it ought to. Uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ ought to, ought to grip you. It ought to grab you. It ought to make a difference when your foot hits the ground every morning. In the book of Acts, there's a great account of how the church came to be in the little town of Philippi. Remarkable events happened. But As happened so often in the book of Acts, people got ticked at Paul. And he was with a guy named Silas in Philippi. And Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. And I've never been thrown into prison before. And it's hard for me to believe that this prison was any better than any prison I've ever seen. In fact, historical evidence shows that First century prisons were horrible. But at midnight in prison, Paul and Silas were reading the Bible and singing praise songs. 
must have been a cappella. They were probably chained, so they couldn't play an instrument. But there they were, singing and praying at midnight. And of all things, an earthquake hit. And this earthquake just shattered everything around it. And basically, those things that were holding the prisoners down and the doors that were locked shut opened up. And the, the guy who was in charge of the prison, who we know only as the Philippian jailer, <laughs> the Philippian jailer came running to the prison, saw everything and thought, that's it, my life is over. I've wasted my life. I am going to be in so much trouble with my boss that I'm going to lose my life. And so this guy took a sword and was ready to... But Paul called out to him. And he said, hey, we're here, we're here. Don't do that. And the jailer did something. The jailer ran to the prisoners. Just a few minutes earlier, he'd been in charge of them. He'd been ruling over them. Acts says that the jailer ran and fell on his knees before Paul and Silas. And here's what he said. What do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to be saved? That, that's the big question in life, isn't it? What do I have to do to be saved? And, and I think of all of us here today. We all need to be saved from something, I'm guessing. Maybe you're a student and you're in a rotten situation. I'm in a rotten situation in school. I'm going to flunk out. I need to be saved. Maybe your job is such that you need to be saved your marriage, your family. I, I don't know what the situations are. Maybe you're just at a crisis point in life saying, I'm wasting it. What do I need to, what do, I need to do to be saved? How can I save this life? And Paul's words have been ringing out for 2,000 years through the centuries. They rang out that night they ring through this church this morning and I pray that they ring out from this place all day long. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's as simple as that. Believe. Believe in the risen Christ, and you will be saved. Believing in the risen Christ brings meaning to every minute of life. Believing in the risen Christ gives you a foundation to stand on that will never fall. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ means that your life will not be a waste you know that your life will not be a waste and that even the little mundane things that you do day after day when done while believing in Christ make a difference for him. If you have never believed in the resurrection, please see me today. I would love to talk to you further. But if you have been locked in lethargy and you've been locked in laziness and you've been negligent in believing in the resurrection today, brothers and sisters, believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It brings meaning to all of life. Heavenly Father, thank you for Paul. Thank you, Jesus, that you as risen Lord, appeared to him on the Damascus road and saved him. Thank you that you have saved many who are here today. I pray that you'd save many more and I pray that today the truth of your resurrection would resound from this place and would resound in Broomfield and the surrounding areas. God, 
Let this truth go forward today. May the truth of the Philippian jailer impact even more lives today. We love you. It's our joy to sing about this great resurrection. Thank you that life is on a foundation that will not be moved as we believe in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Thank you that we can know that all of our actions in life have purpose as we believe and live for the risen Lord. We love you and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen.